Hello, everyone, and welcome to this last edition of 2023, This Week in Hospitality Marketing. I am your host, Lauren Gray. Thank you so much for joining me on what will be our last Friday of 2023. And for those of us, for those of you that are watching me simulcasted when we do the time shift for APAC, uh, 11.30 a.m. Wednesday, uh, Sydney time and 11.30 a.m. London time, uh, I'm speaking to you from the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the last episode of 2023 will actually be airing the first episode of 2024 for pretty much most of the uh, the world. We, we broadcast to 209 countries uh, on our TV channel, this being it. And if you're watching a simulcast, by the way, on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, those are some of the channels we use also. But we also have a TV channel, the Hospitality Channel, which is on your Roku's, Google's, Amazon's, Apple's, Samsung's, LG, all smart TVs. Our channel is there. The show is always on the free side of the gateway. And uh, it goes up to our nine. We also uh, have our podcast, which we broadcast on our radio station, Hospitality Radio, which goes uh, globally as well. It's on 26 different international radio station distribution systems. Go figure that one. Uh, so our podcast is there as well. But also our podcast is on 39 platforms on traditional podcasting, anything from uh, Apple iTunes, uh, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, uh, Spotify, on and on and on. They're all there. We're on all of them. So you can't escape us. Even on your game console, you can't escape us. We uh, broadcast on Twitch. And so if you use your uh, PS5 or Xbox, we're there as well. So we are everywhere. <laughs> to that end, our last show this year, 2023, a little bit forward thinking. I know uh, usually this time most shows, uh, for any merit of context, tend to do a year in retro and so forth. We will have those moments in January. We'll go back to 2023 and talk a little bit about certain pivot points, milestones on things that have happened, transitions. Obviously, July 1st, GA4 was a, a big one and so forth. But I really want to focus on what some of the earlier decisions of 2024 will be. As with any industry, and hospitality seems to be more accentuated to this, uh, we live on our budget cycles. When we end a budget, we always are trying to make sure that we exhaust all funds available and so forth. We try to exasperate anything that we have as resource within the budget still so that we can go into the next year with the same anticipation of what we made the budget for. And we get into a fresh, shiny new 2024 budget, whether it's bigger or smaller, but it is certainly by all means normally different. And to that difference comes a lot of uh, pivotal decision models that come up. Uh, annually, most companies review their vendor relationships. Most companies review their internal structures. Most companies review their uh, roadmap as to what they anticipate beyond the functional forecasting of revenues and business levels that they plan on having for the next year, or their prognostications of what they think they'll be doing. Expansions, refinements, um, improvements, what have you. And what usually comes up is some regular things. You know, of course, like I said, vendor reviews, contract reviews, method reviews, and so forth. And in that method review discussion comes the idea of internalization. Uh, more specifically, based on the fact that we are the hospitality marketing channel, and uh, because of that, we talk about marketing a lot, the show being it, uh, what usually comes up with marketing is how are we going to handle it next year? Are we going to do the same as we have done? Are we going to change what we have done? Are we going to really innovate and do something different? And that comes to our topic today, which is going internal the real challenges of creating an internal digital marketing team. Um, I'm one of the few organizations that willfully and wantingly want to help clients understand and internalize some of their functions. I am an ardent believer that the people most dedicated to the success of your business are the people that get a paycheck with your number on their name, your business name on the top of it and a signature of their boss on the bottom of it. Metaphorically, I guess nowadays, nobody really gets paper checks. Uh, per se. All said, they are much more loyal to the company that pays them than a vendor is to providing services to them. Now, of course, you pay a vendor, but they're not your team member. They're not totally invested in your business because they diversify their businesses, which we'll get to as to the asset value, what a third party relationship is. So I always say with any client that not only will I do what you're asking me to do, um, I'll be happy to explain how I'm doing it. And if you're looking for people, one, I can help you try to find people. Two, I will help you try to train those people to get them up to speed as fast as possible about how you want things done and how things we've been doing for you have been working so that they can inherit some of these things. 
But there goes the rub because it changes as to how that gets translated. <clears throat> so when you internalize as a company, you're looking at the benefit ratio, you would hope, um, in the sense of why the, what's the motivation of internalization? Unfortunately, most of the time, the catalyst for the decision or the consideration of internalization is cost savings. It is very easy to assume that if you internalize, you can mitigate the direct cost of what you're asking a third party to do for you. And to some point, that is legitimate. Uh, you're paying a third party for the convenience of not having to have the burden of the internal responsibility. For anybody that uh, does this for a living, which I'm hoping I'm talking to directly, is there's more to the salary of a person than the money that you pay them. There is all of the things that as a company you offer in benefits and your contribution to those benefits, uh, what you offer as incentives, the cost value associated with unproductivity, vacations, holidays, the things that get absorbed by you as a company that get paid to the user now or to your, 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 your team member. You look for optimization that you have them available to whatever you're asking them to do under the context of their hired job description. Although good team members will venture off of the job description to do whatever it can be helpful to the company, which obviously we can talk more about too. Coffee's good. Um, but all said and done, it is easier to do that than it is to say, bring a third party such as myself in where you're paying for my time. That's how I base it. Now, some vendors, most, a lot of vendors actually do it like, go oh, pay us to have the availability of our resources and we will do things up to a certain level. And if you want more than that, you're going to have to pay directly for that. Um, all said and done, you're paying for the luxury of the usage of the resources of a third party. That works well for the expertise that it can provide, hopefully. Um, but obviously a cost savings of internalization is if you can get somebody that can do the same quality, caliber, quantity of work on a salary, you have much more latitude of work and much more expansive use of that resource than paying directly for everything that you're asking a third party to do. That's the cost savings value of it. And that usually is what drives most of the consideration of internalization. Unfortunately, when you use that as the basis of your only reason to internalize, I'll say this as bluntly as I can, it will fail. If your whole purpose is simply to continue to improve cost savings by internalization, it will fail. It may not fail the first month or first year. It may not fail the second year, but it will fail eventually because you can only squeeze it so much if you're only basing on how much money it saves you. It's the same logic argument I give any company that you can't cost yourself into profit, cost savings yourself into profitability. You can't reduce costs to improve profit as the only lever you pull. It certainly can contribute, but it is not the only solution. If you use it as a solo solution, it will not work. Same too with internalization, because here's the rub of that. If you ignore performance as a value proposition and only as a tool to use for cost savings, then you will always try to get more for less. You will always try to do more with less. And you will eventually either exhaust your resource or diminish the value of the resource due to inability to perform at all the levels that you want it to perform. You have to have cost factor as a great motivator, yes, but it should be in collaboration with performance value. Are we improving what we can do for ourselves by internalizing what we do in the sense of having total control. Sometimes there is some great yes answers to that. Internalization breeds a tremendous autonomy in being able to provide yourself with variable successes of somebody's skill set. Here's where things begin to fall off the wheels of the wagon kind of thing. These people that are qualified in doing what they do are very expensive. <clears throat> We also, through the people that make these decisions, um, don't understand the full scope of all of the things that they truly need and assign too much responsibility to a person that may be skilled in a single solution set, say social media, social paid media perhaps. And they imply that they can also be burdened or tasked with paid campaigns outside of paid social. Hey, it's paid campaigns, right? Digital marketing is digital marketing. No, it's not. Um, 
This can create two scenarios for that person. One is it disheartens them that they're being burdened with way too much more than they can do, or it diminishes their ability to do what they're good at because they're diluted too much in the other things that they've been asked to do. Either which way is a fail. Either which way, it's also an expensive fail. Because if you get somebody that's talented in what you're needing, which we'll get to a point in the discussion real quickly, um, then you're only solving for a singular problem, not a comprehensive problem. Um, that square, that, that if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail mentality, is if you hire a person that does a thing you need good done, but then you think that that a person being good at that one thing is also, and should be, because it's somehow mentally related to you, uh, good at anything related to marketing for you, and they're beginning bur the burden of it without the resources to actually succeed. Now, when it comes to this, this hiring of somebody internally and bringing somebody on, um, if they're fully skilled at the, the work you want them to do, they'll be expensive. And if you're smart to realize that you keep them directed to what you hired them for, they're expensive because they're only solving the one thing or the things in combination that you brought them on board for to solve. Uh, a jack of all trades, okay, the idea just goes as a master of none. If you do happen to find a unicorn, which is a person that's good at everything, they can flip a hat and turn into paid media. They can flip a hat and go into social. They can flip a hat and go into CRM. They can flip a hat and go into web optimization. They can flip a hat and go into SEO. Those unicorns are exceptionally expensive. And they're also exceptionally temporal because until if you push them too far, or ask too much, or don't give them the resources, or you don't hold up your end of the bargain, and in some cases, even if you do, they're going to always continually look other options because they are a unicorn. They are what everybody wants, a single one-stop solution for their work. They can get overwhelmed and overworked, and that burns them out of, why do I need to go through this? I'll find another place that isn't going to demand this much of me, and if I don't make the same one, maybe perhaps probably more, and off I go. That's one aspect. Another aspect is a lot of times you make a very, companies make very large decisions about replacing and internalizing everything based on one problem. They don't have a good social presence. They don't have a good paid campaign presence. They don't have a good web content development. Whatever it is, they, they, they lump everything together and say, we have a digital marketing issue. We need to hire somebody to fix this issue. So the interview process goes, and this is the blind leading the blind usually, they don't know the skill sets that they're needing or they're just familiar with buzzwords. And they ask the questions of a, of a candidate and the candidate quickly understands quickly whether they know what they're talking about or not, if they're good at it. And they get brought in for what they think is the solution for what they want, when in fact, that person doesn't want to go beyond what they've been asked to do. And you now have only created an internal problem because now you push your third parties away, things aren't getting done and the problem unravels. The other part I wanted to get to was this decision process of internal repair of internalization to fix existing issues. I would always approach any existing singular issue under the variables of what you're looking as options to fix it. The pros and cons, the, the, the spreadsheets, the worksheets, the whiteboards that says option one, two, and three. Let's break it down into categories that we understand. Cost, value, performance, resources, viability, basic categorization kind of stuff. And look at how you would address solving the problem. You have a problem, say, with organic social, perpetual control of organic social. What are your option variances? One is a vendor that you do have, don't have, internalization that you can or can't get, software that you can or can't use. And how do any of those particularly work? You break them down into those categories of stuff. So the idea of internalization should be based on an evolution of what you can do for yourself not a singular solution to a particular perspective issue problem. The other is that um, a lot of times, most companies I've come to work with, I would say it sounds like my clients are bad. No, I work with a lot of companies in and out that are trying to understand what their issue is. Why aren't we doing good with this? And they're, they're very wonderful companies. They're looking at themselves critique, critically and saying, how is it that we're not free able to do as well as we want to do? with this medium? How is it that we just kind of do paid ads? How is it that, are we using all the options available to pay ads and so forth? And they're wise enough to listen to vendors and understand that their vendors are selling what they do as services, not necessarily all of the spectrum of things that they should consider, only the things that they want to sell them to consider for. And 
the idea of internalization is to cut the Gillian, uh, the, 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 the knot, so to speak, and solve it internally with people that are dedicated to your company. It's not an all or nothing thing. You have basically three choices uh, on the table when it comes to this type of perspective. One is to continue with complete third party usage. You hire third parties, you trust the third parties, they do good work for you. It is expensive in comparison to contrast, but they are doing all the things that they say they're going to do in the way that they're going to do them. And that all of the performance metrics that you all have mutually designed, the KPIs that you have defined as the success metrics are all being met and measured. Okay, that's one. The second is on the other end of the spectrum, full replacement. We stop using third parties. We completely internalize. This usually means a full team has to be created. A single person can't take on the burden. I mean, if you're a single unit, there is that, yes, a person can. If you're more than a single unit, no, that person can't. And do it well, I should say. And then there's the middle point, which is a blend between having third party re 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 relationships and having internal structures doing what internal structures can do that, and having third parties do what they can't uh, and policing them. Um, there is a solution for every company in some perspective, depending upon what their goals are for doing this. So if you're looking at 2024, the first recommendation I would have is to remove as much of the politics associated with this decision as possible. Who gets credit for it? Who doesn't get credit for it? Who is to benefit from it? Who isn't to benefit from it? Who's in control of it? Should it happen? Who's not in control of it? Should it not happen? Um, who, how do we uh, mitigate the mutual usage of these resources? Should they be done? So forth and so on. Clear as much of the, poli the pol politics out and try to be as uh, singular in your mission as you hope your team members are. And that is what's the good of the company. How can we get this to work best for us in whatever way that gets to scale? Who would be best to run it? Who would be best to work with it? Who would be best to work uh, uh, in combinations and so forth? Get the best point you can to reference that. Then now look at your choices. What are your tech stacks? What are you using technology-wise? Your POS, your PMS, um, your CRM systems, your communication systems. Uh, what fluency do you have in the channels that you're using for digital marketing, your social media channels, your paid channels, your website? How much control and influence do you have over that? Your content development, your SEM strategy, your SEO strategy, so forth and so on. Lay it all out as to who's doing it now and how well is it being done. Then decide if there is a uh, palatable way to see how much you can internalize you have your tech stacks, you have your depoliticalized de decision-making model. Now you're looking at, it's wonderful to think if we internalize this, can we really find the people that we want to do what we have defined as to what we need to have done? And are they at a realm of affordability? Because you might get sticker shock saying, well, I want to get a SEO, uh, a SEO person, I want to get an SEM person, I want to get a social person, I want to get a content developer, web developer. And then you start racking up uh, payrolls for all of these people, and you're used to how hospitality pays people, and these people are, you know, good ones. They're six figure already, individually. So now you're looking at it going, well, and you might make that as a balanced choice of your decision to say this is too expensive to internalize completely. What would we want to keep in control directly, and what would we scale third party? Now you're talking about mitigation of balancing out using resources that are scalable and affordable for using them, okay, versus ones that you want to keep control over internally. Now, here's some guidance for those kind of thought processes. Anything that relates to data that is your guests, any data that's related to an asset of yours, 100% am I saying you should always have somebody internally over those. Always. First off, every asset of the company should be in the control of the company. Your domains, your websites, your databases of CRM, your analytics, your data collection of all of the things, your accounts for your ad campaigns, the accounts for your social campaigns. Every aspect of what you represent as the company, as an asset, should be under the direct control 
of the company, always and forever. And I don't mean just a person in the company. It should be in a nice universal administrative account that's put into a safe somewhere that, and that is the ultimate administrative key to everything. That email address is to everything. It's always as administrator on everything. So that regardless who sits in the chairs in your organization, there's always a place that everybody can go to that will always give the access and administrative control of all the assets you have in the company. It is a, it is one of the things you write on a tablet when you come down from a mountain. You must own and operate all assets of the company. Outside of that, how you run those things can be regulated out to the best resource that can optimize those things. You may find that, in all honesty, paid campaigns to be directly and fair. They require expertise in their construction. They require expertise in their implementation. They require expertise in their modeling and then in their maintenance. But they don't require hand-holding and exiting 24-7. They require monitoring. They require metrics, notifications, balances, and benchmarks. If it performs outside of this parameter, above or below, somebody should know that that's going on well enough ahead to make sure that there's a corrective action. It doesn't mean somebody has to sit and stare at a, a screen that changes click, 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 and think that they're getting paid 40 hours a week to do this. So if any agency, third party or otherwise, tells you that this is a full-time role, they are not telling you the total truth. There's a lot of upfront time to build it correctly and do all the things I just said. But the back end time is really about corrective and repetitive monitoring and corrections implementations. Now, that doesn't take out for the fact that there is always something new every month that has to be done. New campaigns have to be launched. Variations have to be created. Interpretations of activities have to be understood. All of those things have to happen. But it is not a 8 a.m. cup of coffee till 6 p.m. Got to go home, come back again, 8 a.m., do it all over again world. There are aspects of what we do that require that kind of attention. Anything related to CRM, customer relationship management, is a persistent monitoring program. And, and this is the caveat of saying you should always have somebody internally related to this. The best person to interact with CRM data and to, and to maintain its security and for your, your, your privacy issues, the legalities associated with that, is somebody internally is your designated person to do that. And that they know that it won't be used negatively. It won't be handled improperly. And it will always be correctively done to the benefit of the best of the company. Any CRM relationship, email campaigns, content going to people, interactions with people, any of that should be handled from the company. Outside of the reasons I just gave you, the biggest one is authenticity. If a guest is getting responses from a bot that your agency thought would be cute to put on your website or an agency ad, uh, ad account manager uh, who wants to comment on something and apparently clearly does not understand what they're commenting on because they're not at property level or from a corporate perspective, the customer will feel un uh, that you are unauthentic. They'll feel like they're, you, they're just being put into a grinder, a meat grinder elsewhere, that you're, they're not dealing with the company that they thought they were directly. Authenticity comes from ownership. Ownership comes from being a part of the team on the company. That person should always be an aspect of your company. They will always look out for the best interest of the data usage. They'll always look out for the best interest for uh, the communications and the authenticity associated with it. Outside of that comes the different levels of interpretation. I would say the next valuable internalization was having somebody that is competent and capable of understanding analytics and metrics. Unfortunately, and you'll hear me soapbox this a lot, there's a lot of um, vendors who are very soft about their accuracy when it comes to account and inf information, interpretation, data, and so forth. They, they kind of lean to the number that's more favorable to their presentation than the number that they need to address, good or bad, with the client about what they should do about it. For that reason, you should always have a watchdog or somebody on your team that is diligent, knowledgeable, and, and, and proactively aware of everything that is happening. They're the person that when walking down the hall and you bump into them for your cup of coffee in the morning, can tell you how the day is going with numbers. That person works tightly with marketing, definitely. Revenue management, definitely. Ownership, definitely. Okay, because that person is always making others aware of where the performances of the metrics are. If there's a concern, there's an issue, there's a trend, there's an insight, there's a revelation, there is a, an epiphany. That person is the person that keeps track of all that. 
The next down that would be a, whether it stays internal or external is content. The genuineness, the docent of the content, the person that keeps the voice and the vision of the company clear, regardless of who's wanting to use it in what medium, whether it's a social media post, whether it's a paid ad campaign, whether it's an OTT uh, thing, or whether it's an audio ad, whether it's any video, anything, website content, special offer, that docent of content should be on your team. They're the keeper of the keys of the integrity of the voice. They're the keeper of the keys of the integrity of the concept. They're the keeper of the keys of the mission of the company. They're the ones that make sure that nobody puts purpley twirly letters on a website or refers to slang words in an email or has a picture that isn't as accurate as it should be about rooms and or colors on a logo and what have you. That docent is as important as the first two I just mentioned. From there, it begins to turn into how well you can utilize the resources that might be available for people that handle your social media engagements. I truly, and this goes back to your CRM engagement, social organic is to me more and more a relationship of CRM than it is as a marketing tool for communication. It is both, but I would now say it's better to lean to the side of CRM than it is to lean to the side of marketing message because social is used more and more as a means of communication of purpose and intent from the company and communication of questions and inquiry from the guests or future guests. This goes into the realm of, of review and revenue manage, of re review management, uh, consumer engagement, that's all CRM, that as you dialogue with responses in the uh, customer uh, uh, sites such as TripAdvisor and all the places of Google, uh, my business and so forth, that you have a constant persistent voice that is authentic and genuine from the company's perspective. Don't let that go off to a vendor if at all possible. So that person that handles social organic, I would also tend to put onto the side of internalization. So your force rankings are moving in that direction, okay? You, you have CRM engagements as being squarely on the side of internalization. You have your analytics interpretation and engagements squarely onto the side, but it's marginally going to center of, of what you have on your, your internalization. Then you have your social organic close to the medium, but still on your side of the fence when it comes to internalization. And then let's talk about maybe transitioning over to the other side, third party engagements, paid ad campaigns, uh, distributions, communications, um, web uh, analytic, uh, excuse me, web UI interfaces, how it works, how it functions, uh, keeping up with trends, keeping up with patterns, keeping up with functionalities, usabilities, accuracies, so forth. Uh, citations work and communications, make sure you're connected correctly so everything is working as it should. Paid campaigns on multiple platforms, paid social campaigns on multiple platforms. Uh, overall analytic strategic platforming discussions as to how to use all of these tools to the optimization of the KPIs with the, with the, the, the company. This can exist comfortably and persistently on the third party world. There allows you the scalability and usability. Why? One is that all of those things don't require a constant daily, hour by hour, minute by minute, tiller, hand, uh, hand on the tiller for this. They require professional engagement understanding. To buy those people is to be expensive. To put them internally into your team is to make a very expensive person that isn't totally being used for it all the time. So then as you see them sitting playing word feud on uh, the computer, you begin to hand them other tasks that aren't in their realm and you can either discourage them in staying with you because you're giving them tasks that aren't in what they consider their job description and you're looking at it as I'm going to optimize my time that I'm already paying you for, that's where things begin to go wrong. Keeping people focused on what you brought them in for, doing what they can do, giving them the resources to succeed, that will keep somebody loyal to you even when other people come courting with more money. That was a very fast answer to a very big problem. Anyways, um, you see that I'm leaning to the idea of being in the middle between the two extremes. Total internalization versus total third-party uh, reliance. Um, one of the things I haven't had is some of the off one offs, the tangents of some of these things, and I'm known for tangents. Internalization, total internalization. If you have the scale to do it and the funds to do it, and you are clear that you're not doing it always under the idea of just a pure cost savings motivation that you balance it with performance metrics and usabilities and internal resource value that 
Now, if you have a corporate marketing team that can address and handle all the individual properties that are engaged within that corporate entity well, and it's a trusted resource that has very little third-party communication clutter, uh, which usually happens as having to make introductions and authenticate that, yes, this is your third party we're using and they have the authorization to do this with you and so forth. And then they leave the third party to talk to somebody that's not knowledgeable at the property, okay? And it has to go through an education curve where if and you have an internal team, they can step in and literally have all the accesses that they need and the authority to implement all the things that the property has. And even if they're talking to somebody at a property that doesn't understand what they're wanting to do, they can actually themselves as a company entity go and show up at the property if they actually have to go onto somebody's computer in an office to do something. A third party uh, that would do that, there's a whole other thing of, well, you know, we're going to send the third party over. Uh, there's the, the this trust issue about they're not on our team, they're not on our payroll, they're not from our hotel. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, um, team building education curve that has to go along with having a third party do that. If you have a fully internal team, that gets pushed off to the side to a point because in order for the full team internally to exist, it does have to cover its cost and, and cost factor is a variable to this. It has to be valuable that they're doing what they're doing. They can't be more expensive than the alternative of a third party doing it. For that reason, what I see happens so many times is a company will internalize. They'll go through all the massive expenses and the hunting and the finding, and they get what they think is a team doing this, which is, I've never seen them successfully do it, but let's just say they did. And then they solve all the problems and they get everything the way they want it to do and do all the stuff they're doing for the properties. And now they have an idle team. The team has succeeded. It has knocked down every obstacle, crossed every bridge, climbed every mountain, swam every ocean, and we're still paying them. So what happens? You downsize them and the problems come back. You get rid of them and the problems come back. You got to find more value for them. So what a lot of companies do is they start selling off their services to other companies. At first, non-competitive companies, obviously, people that are companies that they're not in competition with, which is funny when they end up becoming competitors because now their agency is literally helping hotels that they're now competing with. I've seen that happen and it's, it's an uncomfortable room to be in, I got to tell you. Anyways, um... So they go out and they start selling the services. Problem is the success of the internalization of the team that caused them to be so good at what they did is now working against them because they are a third party team to another organization. So all of the things that they were able to do successfully, walk into a property because it was their property, help the people that would work on their team because it's their team, collaborate with teams because they already had the authority and the responsibility to do so. They now in that comfortable world have to unlearn that because now they're the stranger in this other world. They're the outsider in the other world. They're a third party agency, just like the reason why they decided not to have a third party agency internally and, and go with the internalization. Now they're the other side of the coin. And they're not usually skilled at that. They're used to telling a property what to do. They're used to doing what they need to do because they had all the accesses and the keys to the kingdom. And they're not used to realizing, oh, I don't have access to that administrative account. I don't have access to that. I can't change this. Their website, I got to deal with another vendor that they're dealing with for their web. I got to deal with another vendor that's handling their paid. And, and, and it turns into a political knot that they're not used to uh, navigating through. They're not skilled at it the way that other third parties are that do it every day. Um, for that reason, they don't succeed as well as they did internally. And sometimes knowing that they're being asked to do this because they've done such a good job internally that in order to maintain their job, they have to be valuable and viable. So they get sold off. This is one of the more volatile times that internal teams get lost because what you're telling them is because you were so good at what you've done and you've solved all the things we asked you to do, we now have to uh, sell you to continue to pay for your payroll. Now, we want you to do all the stuff you've been doing and because you did a great job at it, but we need you to do more stuff now because, you know, we gave you raises and we give you toys and you get to do all these things. So we're going to sell your services elsewhere. First, it's another one to be able. We're so good, we get sold off. Then it's like, holy crap, now we got to go through all this third party stuff where, yes, hi, I'm the person that was brought on to go over and fix your whatever it is. And, oh, uh, yeah, okay. And you don't try to do this and that. And you got to find the other people that are doing it and all that confusion stuff. And you don't have the authority and you don't, and you have to wait for people to understand and you don't have the trust and so forth and so on. So, they end up going somewhere else. 
Because there's divisionally at least four types of people in, in a circle of industry for us. We have the people that love implementing newness. Opening up a hotel is a great example of that. There's a team that is great at opening up hotels. That same team is not good at the next part, which is running the hotel. They've lost the adrenaline of what they do. They don't want to keep up doing it. They've, they've succeeded. Everything's doing what they've been asked to do. The hotel's open. Everything's running. Off to the next one. Those are teams that are purebreds for just that. They are great at doing that. I would hire them any day that we can open up a hotel. I will never hire them for running a hotel. Not because they can't. It's because that's not what they want to do. So then the next group of people are the people that love doing the work that's done. It's running. It's good. And those are the maintainers. And they're excellent at what they do. But they don't. They can't open a new hotel because they're used to running it as it runs well. They're not there to implement how it runs well. And they have challenges with that. Um, so they do good about running a hotel. Then there's the third group of people, which are the fixers. Those are the people that come in because things aren't doing well and the people that are running it don't understand because they're doing what they've always done and now it's not doing the same thing it used to do and they don't know how to fix it. And then the fixers are in there and they do an amazing job, but they don't continue to maintain after they fix it. They, they get bored. It's kind of like the openers. They're very similar to the openers. They, they're there because they do very well at what they do. They find the issues, correct for the problems, create new solutions for them and so forth. They're not openers. They're not into that where they have to start from zero. They're there to take what's running and refine it, fix it from doing poorly. Then the fourth group of people are the renovators. They're the ones that it can't get fixed. It's changed too much. It can't be run. It's not running well. It's not new, but it has to be redone. Uh, these are the rebranders. These are the ownership switches. These are the ones that go into transition of taking how it is not throwing it all away, but adapting it to how it has to become. Those four segments, and there's fragments of all of them, are kind of the four ways that you look at bringing on people on board. You have those people that are, are those that are innovators and creators. They come in, there's a clean slate. Whatever they put on the slate is the first time it's been put on the slate. That's because well, chalkboards used to be, and anyways, that shows my age. Anyways, um, and then you have those people that are in an organization that's running really well. And they're there to continue to make it run well. Maybe expand it because it's running so well, they can take what they're doing and continue to do it elsewhere as well. Then there's the people that will begin to fix things that it's doing well, but there's things that we need to do better. We need to change and do things. And then there's the people that are like, you know, we have to take what we have and make it do new and innovative and different. All of those types of people are in a cycle to what you're doing for internalization. Internalization is understanding what you're looking for. The same people you hired to create the inception of your internalization may or may not be the same people a year or even two years from now that will be sitting in the same chair doing something for you. They may grow into other roles. They may expand what they're capable of and they love the loyalty of what your company culture and they may stay for that reason. I'm not saying everybody is in the transition, you know, spinning uh, a revolving door of in and out. But the days of staying with a company for 5, 10, 15 years or generationally has long since gone. And now you have people that are in progression of what they want to do, who they want to do it with, and how long do they want to do it. For that reason, you have people that unless they're challenged to what they want to do more of, they're going to continue to want to do what they do well wherever they can find that. Some people just want to do what they do. I learned that lesson the hard way as a manager of hotels many times where I've tried to push people into more administrative roles. They didn't want it. Same too. Some people just love doing what they do. They don't want to expand it. They don't want to change it. They don't want to shift gears and go into other lanes. They want to continue to be the best at what you brought them on board for. And as long as you feed them that, they are happy with that. If they feel like they're no longer being appreciated and or they don't have the challenges of doing what they're doing or they don't have the opportunity to do what they love, they will go some other place to do that. You need to understand that cycle with each individual person you bring on the team. And if you already have a team, how you're changing and cycling the team. That is important. Uh, as to, and I would have to say this, when you're looking at people, I would say the one critical person you want consistency with is the docent. The one person that maintains the integrity of your content. It is one of the most underutilized or undervalued perspective people until you don't have them anymore. The person that always seemed to knew if it felt right. The other person that knew that, that we've done it that way before, or that is not us, or that's not the color, or that's not the way we say things, or that's not the layout that we used to do. And I don't mean to keep it stodgy and stale where 
we do it the same way we've always done for five years. That's not what I'm talking about. That not 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 just repetitiveness. I'm talking about the value of the clarity of the persona of the company, the voice of the company as an authoritative, casual, interactive, first person, third person. Is it is it the way we do things? in the sense of context. Is this how our guests see us persistently? Is this the feel of our the relationship with the company? That person oftentimes may not be even in a role that is designated as that, but they have assumed that because they're the person that always points out we've, you know, that if something doesn't feel right. They're the easiest person to lose if they're not appreciated. If nobody begins to listen to them, they do it anyway, then they've given up hope as to, well, you know, it's changed so much since what it used to be. It's no longer anything that I'm trying to protect. So I'm out of here. And you really notice the loss of that person once they're gone, because now you have no compass point. You have no North Star um, to guide whether what you're doing is similar or, or what you envisioned or what the company has been perceived as. It's very important that that person be maintained. That's one of the three of the people you keep on your side of the equation. You don't allow a third party to be your dosing. You don't allow a third party to tell you whether that fits what you've done. You don't allow a third party to tell you if that's the tone that you've used or the colors or the fonts or the, or the imaging types or whatever. They're there to implement. They're the tip of the spear of what is asked of them, not the person that chucks it. Um, and that per those people have to stay on your side of the fence. So when we're talking about going internal as a 2024 perspective of are you evaluating or do you plan on evaluating uh, in 2024 your, your vendor relationships, your internal usages of your team members and so forth, I would give you this caveat. Um, don't do it for cost, as I've mentioned. Do it for value. How is this going to value your company? Don't do it as an all or nothing. We're not in the world of the Sith as an absolute, our Star Wars fans. We're into the grad grad gradients of usage. The three that I've told you should be on the side of your team are there to be the policemen for everybody else that you use third party or however you decide to solve your problems. Those people, the people that control your assets, the people that control you know, your CRMs, your, your customer engagements, people that control your analytics and the interpretation and understanding of those metrics, okay? And the people that control your content. Those people are on your payroll because they find the value of what they do purely to the value of the company. Everybody else turns into a servant system with them in the sense of how they support what they do. The implementation of the paid campaigns, the implementation of the paid social campaigns, the implementation of the content related to those campaigns, uh, those platforms, the websites, the integrations and, and, and usages of technology, the evaluations of the performance of those technologies uh, in combination with your team keeps everybody, quote, honest. That's the real internal value is keep your people that you trust that are controlling the valued assets of your company on your team. It doesn't take away from your trust of your third party. It doesn't take away from the trust of your, of your external team's usage, but you keep them in the context that they're not the ultimate point of, point of authority, point of truth on those things. Your team is, and they're there to make sure that if the third parties maintain the integrity of what they promised, what they deliver and the metrics their, their uh, performance is evaluated on. So that is my discussion on going internal, the real challenges to creating an internal digital marketing team. So with that, uh, as we close our 2023 season, of course, we'll be back next week in 2024. Uh, we're well into our 10th year of doing this weekly in the live show. We will have a podcast today, a little bit about, as always, the tools and so forth. We try to keep it symbiotic as most of our, our, our loyal listeners follow that, um, hey, you know, our podcast, we talk specifically about tools and techniques of using those tools symbiotically to our topic about the live show. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about um, internalizing using uh, some of the performance or the persona tools that I've talked about for customer generation or targeting generation for your ad campaigns, flipping that around and trying to use persona tools to evaluate the type of persons you would look for to be on your team. And, and this is the ironic part of it, the tools can also be used to discover who you would like to use personality wise as third parties, as to people that you feel you'd be more comfortable working with that have a perspective that is asimilar to what you want as a collaborative team member. So we'll talk about those tools today. Um, as always, thank you for watching us on the Hospitality Channel TV. 
Uh, you can watch us again on Google TV, Apple TV, Amazon TV, Roku TV, LG, and Samsung TV. They're all smart TVs. Just look for the Hospitality Channel. The show's always live on it. If you follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, or not to say Twitter all the time, X, we do live broadcasting on all of those, including Stitch, which is uh, for uh, gamer consoles. You can watch us on that. Um, we also have our hospitality radio station. If you are a hospitality marketing professional and want to join a peer group in which you can ask and discuss openly conversations like we had today with people where we get Q&A relationships. We also have some really interesting things rolling on 2024. We're going to be doing lessons. We're taking a lot of what we're doing in the Hospitality Marketing Club, which is, by the way, you can go to hospitalitymarketing.club and uh, put your email in. I'll send you a quiz. You pass the quiz. You come and join us. The quiz being whether or not you're actually doing the work in the sense of we're not there to teach if you don't know what PPC is or whatever, we're there to deal with people that are already working in digital marketing. And then we're there to have a uh, journeyman and professional or expert uh, peer discussions, which you ask smart questions and hear from smart people and talking about specific things. And you have Q and A's and live presentations and so forth. It's really a fun club. And a lot of our conversations for the live show here come from our club discussions as well. It's a closed community. It's not on Facebook or anything like that. It's on our own social platform that we have on our site at the hospitality marketing club. Um, speaking of which, you can always go and watch all of our reruns uh, for both podcasts and the live show. Podcast is on 39 platforms, TV shows on the TV channel, obviously. But we also have hospitalitychannel.tv, which is our I Love Lucy rerun version of all of our live shows and podcasts based on uh, data uh, data broadcast as our topic and or um, co-host. Which, by the way, we're going to have a lot more co-hosts next year. I know I said this toward the end of this year, but with all the changes that we're going on with budgets and GA4 and so forth, we really just didn't go and start bringing other people in uh, as more and more people had more specific questions about these platforms and usages. We just kept the show more specific to topic and task associated with budgets and GA4 and so forth. So next year, we're going to broaden that up and have other experts come in and start talking more again about other things related to the industry as well. So um, with that, uh, yeah, like I said, Dave, we're doing uh, different trainings and classes as well. See a lot of that coming up where we're going to have free classes and pay classes and so forth that are very specific to particular solutions and so forth. So with all of that, um, my name is Lauren Gray. I wish you all the happiest of holidays um, in spite of all the things that are going on in the world. We hope that you have a very peaceful and happy holiday for those who can. Uh, for those New Year's, uh, best wishes for everyone uh, for the coming New Year. And um, we wish you all goodwill for everyone. So with that, we will see you next year, uh, next Friday, for show 439 of This Week in Hospitality Marketing. Until then, thank you so very much for the pleasure of your company today. Bye now.